Christianity will go. It will vanish and shrink. We're more popular than Jesus now. I don't know which will go first, rock and roll or Christianity. With these words, in March of 1966, major changes began in the life of the Beatles' lead singer and legend John Lennon. He will pass away in 14 years. John Lennon will be killed by five random shots in the back. So as practice shows, it is worth being afraid not only of haters, but also of some selfish fans. Who is guilty for the murder of John Lennon? And how was the last day of his life? This is Biographer Express. Today, we will tell you what brought the world-famous artist to a tragic end. After the Beatles' breakup, John Lennon decided to develop a solo career. In August of 1971, together with his wife Yoko Ono, they moved to America, where they began to support an active anti-war and radical left policy. The government did not like that. The administration of President Nixon actively tried to deport John for three and a half years and pit the FBI against him. But he stubbornly wanted to stay in America, and in 1975, he received a green card. In search of a safe place, the family settled in Dakota, overlooking Central Park at 1 West 72nd Street. After the birth of his son in 1975, John decided to end his concert activity and devoted all his time to the child. For almost five years, John practically did not perform and did not release anything. Only in the fall of 1980, he came out of the lull, releasing a joint album with Yoko, Double Fantasy. The album's mood reflected Lennon's satisfaction with finally stabilizing family life. Just weeks before his tragic death, Lennon found out that the record had been certified gold. John finally began to actively give interviews, talking to journalists, sometimes for eight hours a day. He was going to return to his former success. According to Ono, she and John didn't look into the distant future, but planned to finally see world peace. Three days before his death, in an interview with Rolling Stone, Lennon uttered eerily prophetic words. Give peace a chance, not shoot people for peace. All we need is love. I believe it. Here, we would like to take a short pause to ask, what do you think the fate of John Lennon would have been if he had left the United States in the spring of 1973? Could it guarantee him a successful future and save his life? Write your opinion in the comments. What about your private life and your own sense of security these days? David Bowie, I think, has recently said that the great thing about New York is that he can walk down the street and people, instead of rushing up and ripping his clothes off, will come out, or rather just walk past him and say, Hi, David, how are you? And he exactly. can say, I'm very well. Is it the same for John and Yoga? Yeah, that's what made me finally stay here. It wasn't a conscious decision. I just found that oh, I was going to movies, going to restaurants. And the five years, you think, you know, it was just baking bread and the baby. No, because I, I went to Hong Kong and walked around. And people cannot appreciate what it was. To, when I left England, I still couldn't go on the streets. It was still Carnaby Street and all that stuff was going on. We couldn't walk around the block, couldn't go to a restaurant, unless you wanted to go with the business of the star going to the restaurant garbage. I've even been walking the streets for the last seven years. All this time, we keep in mind John's quote in which he compared the popularity of the Beatles to Jesus. We do it in the same way as the fan of the Beatles and John Lennon, Mark David Chapman, kept that idea in his head. He was quite a religious person, and therefore he was outraged by such a statement by Lennon, and the image that he painted for himself, a freedom fighter. A creator calling out the world, the Messiah. It was incomparable with his way of life and public statements. But once, Mark wanted to become Lennon. Then, Mark decided for himself to fix everything. Over the next 10 years, he had several obsessions on how to do it. He wanted to be as famous as John, to overshadow his success. Why is he so famous and I'm nobody, he thought. So one of his obsessions was to kill someone famous. But who? The possible contenders were Johnny Carson, Paul McCartney, Jacqueline Kennedy, Ronald Reagan, and Elizabeth Taylor. However, by the time he finally decided to take the step, Chapman's opinion of John Lennon had deteriorated, and he chose the former idol as his target. Anthony Fawcett's book, John Lennon, One Day at a Time, influenced that decision. After reading it, Chapman saw the performer as a liar who sings about love while indulging in debauchery and preaches renunciation of wealth while lining his pockets with millions of dollars. So the murder of Lennon was supposed to restore justice and make him famous. December 8, 1980. 
In the morning, Chapman left his room at the Sheridan Hotel, leaving behind personal items that wanted to be found. He bought a copy of The Catcher in the Rye, in which he wrote, This is my statement, signed Holden Caulfield. The novel took on great personal significance for him, as he wanted to model his life on that of protagonist Holden Caulfield. He also considered the world cynical and unfair. The man spent most of the day talking to fans and the doorman at the entrance to the Dakota flat building where Lennon lived. There, he met John's housekeeper, who was returning from a walk with Lennon's five-year-old son, Sean. Chapman reached out to shake Sean's hand and said that he was a beautiful boy, quoting John's song, Beautiful Boy, Darling Boy. Meanwhile, John and Yoko had been working on the promo for the new album since early morning. We woke up to a shiny blue sky spreading over Central Park. The day had an air of bright eyes and bushy tails. At 11 a.m., John and Ono had a photo shoot for Rolling Stone magazine. Brilliant Annie Leibovitz was behind the camera. She recalled, John came to the door in the black leather jacket, his hair slicked back. He had that early Beatle look. That photo shoot would soon become iconic because of the cute shot where Lennon kissed and hugged his wife, lying in the fetal position. After that, John gave an interview to RKO Radio. It was recorded at Lennon and Ono's home. In the end, John gave an autograph to the interviewers and signed the album to the radio station producer. The marker did not write well and it took some time. But John said that he was honored to give an autograph since he liked to sign anything because he loved people. At the end of the interview, he said, I consider that my work won't be finished until I'm dead and buried and I hope that's a long, long time. It was almost 5 p.m. when John Lennon and his wife left Dakota on their way to the record plant. There were fans and photographers at the entrance. John signed a copy of the double fantasy record for a silent guy named Mark. Subsequently, recalling that episode, Mark will say, He was very kind to me. Ironically, very kind, and he was patient with me. The limousine was waiting, his wife was waiting in the limousine, and he took his time with me, and he got the pen going, and he signed my album. He asked me if I needed anything else. I said, no, no, sir, and he walked away. Very cordial and a very decent man. After that, the couple went to a scheduled recording session. In the studio, John and Ono spent the entire evening, after which they went home. Their limousine pulled up to Lennon's house around 10.50 p.m. Yoko got out of the car first, followed by John. Passing through the arch, Lennon saw the same fan for whom he had recently signed an album. Mark Chapman released the 38 Charter Arms undercover revolver in his pocket. The pistol, which he bought back on October 27th and brought with him from Hawaii, where he had just recently quit his job as a security guard. The baggage at the airport at that time was not scanned or detailed inspected. As John passed by, Mark fired five shots into his back. Four bullets entered the body, two in the back, two in the shoulder. He probably didn't understand what was going on. However, Mark was in no hurry. He took J.D. Salinger's novel, The Catcher in the Rye, out of his pocket and began to read to the sound of approaching police sirens. He planned to quote the novel as his manifesto and wait for the police to arrive. Chapman was arrested. The bleeding John, the police, without waiting for an ambulance, independently delivered him to the emergency room of the Roosevelt Hospital. Doctors were aware of a victim with gunshot wounds who urgently needed medical attention. But a couple of minutes after arrival, at 11.15 p.m., John was declared dead. At that time, he was only 40. He's wearing his uh, brown leather jacket with a little fur collar. Uh, he had blue jeans on, uh, track shoes, and a, um, and a red T-shirt with Oriental print on it. Opened his chest uh, and started giving uh, internal cardiac massage. Uh, the heart itself was intact, um, and the vessels above the heart were were, uh, what were injured, and, and we worked on him. We didn't know who he was, we were just working on him. And you get into a rhythm. Uh, you start pumping the heart, people are doing their thing, and then someone starts going through these belongings. And it's at that point someone says, you know, his driver's license, and I remember seeing a gold American Express card that said John Lennon. Uh, and up before that, someone said, hey, that looks like John Lennon, and I said, no, that, that's not John Lennon. You know, it's like doubting Thomas. It, it couldn't possibly be John Lennon. And, and then they brought out his stuff, his ID, it is John Lennon. And that's when I had my uh, OMG moment. The sad news was announced during an NFL football game between the New England Patriots and the Miami Dolphins, broadcasted on WABC. 
The TV channel producer was at Roosevelt Hospital due to a traffic accident and found out from a police officer that none other than John Lennon was lying next to him. Excuse me, officer, what did you say? He wondered. Soon, he contacted the channel, the announcers of the football match, and told them the news. There were only 40 commercial seconds in the break to think about whether to voice it or not. They tried to present the news discreetly. Yes, we have to say it. Remember, this is just a football game, no matter who wins or loses. An unspeakable tragedy confirmed to us by ABC News in New York City. John Lennon, outside of his apartment building on the west side of New York City, the most famous, perhaps, of all of the Beatles, shot twice in the back, rushed to Roosevelt Hospital, dead on arrival. The day after that, Ono released a statement announcing that there would be no funeral for John. The text ended with the words, John loved and prayed for the human race. Please do the same for him. Yoko Ono scattered Lennon's ashes in New York's Central Park, where the Strawberry Fields Memorial, named after the Beatles song Strawberry Fields Forever, was later created. People constantly come to the memorial to honor the memory of the legend. But this is not the only such place. People still come to Dakota, where Lennon was killed, to the statue of John Lennon in his native Liverpool, and to a dozen other memorials worldwide to honor the memory of a talented performer. Once in an interview, Yoko Ono said that she was glad to see fans under the windows of Dakota on that day, since they are part of their family. You're probably wondering, what happened to the killer of the legend? Mark David Chapman was taken to the police, where after a couple of hours, he said, I'm sure the big part of me is Holden Caulfield, who is the main person in the book. The small part of me must be the devil. Chapman was charged with second-degree murder. His wife, Gloria Chapman, knew about her husband's preparations for the murder of Lennon, but did nothing. Mark later said he held a deep grudge against her, that she didn't go to somebody, even the police, and say, look, my husband's bought a gun and he says he's going to kill John Lennon. More than a dozen psychologists and psychiatrists interviewed Chapman six months before the trial, three for the prosecution, six for the defense, and several more for the court. Several standard diagnostic procedures and over 200 hours of clinical interviews were conducted. All six defense experts concluded that Chapman was mentally ill, citing paranoid schizophrenia or even manic depressive psychosis. During interrogations, Chapman was also asked if he had any doubts about his plans after Lennon was so polite when signing him a record. Yes, he said. There was an inner struggle for a while there, you know? What am I doing here? Leave now. It wasn't all totally cold-blooded, but most of it was. I did try to tell myself to leave. I've got the album. Take it home. Show my wife. Everything will be fine. But I was so compelled to commit that murder that nothing would have dragged me away from that building. Chapman's lawyers urged him to plead not guilty because of insanity, but the prosecution insisted that his delirium was not psychosis and instead diagnosed him with various personality disorders, allowing him to stand trial. Moreover, Chapman was happy to cooperate with the prosecution experts, more than his defense, probably not wanting to be considered crazy. In February of 1981, Chapman sent a handwritten statement to the New York Times urging everyone to read The Catcher in the Rye, calling it an extraordinary book that holds many answers. In June, Chapman said he wanted to drop his insanity defense and plead guilty. His lawyer, Jonathan Marks, objected by asking serious sanity questions and legally challenged his right to make a decision. At the next hearing on June 22nd, Chapman said that God told him to plead guilty and that he would not change his statement and never appeal, regardless of the verdict. Mark Chapman decided of his own free will. Judge Dennis Edwards Jr. declined further assessments and called him capable of pleading guilty. On August 24, 1981, the verdict was heard. The district attorney said that Mark Chapman murdered an easy path to fame. Chapman was asked if he had anything to say. He stood up and read an excerpt from The Catcher in the Rye, in which Holden told his sister what he wanted to do with his life. I keep picturing all these little kids playing some game in this big field of rye and all. Thousands of little kids. Nobody's around. Nobody big, I mean, except me. And I'm standing on the edge of some crazy cliff. What I have to do, I have to catch everybody if they start to go over the cliff. I mean, if they're running and they don't look where they're going, I have to come out from somewhere and catch them. 
That's all I do all day. I just be the catcher in the rye and all. The judge sentenced Chapman to 20 years to life and ordered his psychiatric treatment while incarcerated. Since he became eligible for parole, Chapman has asked to be released 11 times. Since 2000, Mark is legally entitled to do this every two years. 11 times he was denied. In August of 2022, Chapman's 12th parole hearing was held. Today, looking back at the events of that day, it may seem that Chapman achieved to become famous. Yes, he gained popularity, but the world will remember him only as the guy who killed John Lennon, and nobody can even remember his name. John, because of his efforts and love for creativity, has become a legend whose songs are listened to after more than a dozen years. And thanks to this universal love, he will be famous for many more years and maybe forever. Lennon, unfortunately, is not the only famous performer who passed away too soon. Freddie Mercury, a favorite of many, also died in his prime. But the weapon of his murder was not a gun, but a disease. Click on the icon that appeared on your screen to find out the details of his death. Who infected him with HIV? Where is he buried? And how were the last years of his life? Follow the link and find out everything. And do not forget to thank the authors of this video with a like. Biographer Express was with you. See you soon.